Thanks, thanks very much indeed. So not much to follow then, basically, is the short answer to that. Now, I'm, my background is in philosophy. Uh, my other great interest, I think it's fair to say, is uh, food and eating, always has been. And I recently kind of put the two together and talked about food and philosophy, which isn't talked about a great deal, it has to be said. History of philosophy, philosophers have basically looked down on food as a trivial thing. And, and I wanted to kind of show how actually food and eating is not a trivial thing at all. And when I was thinking of a phrase that would capture the central idea of the book, I thought to know how to eat is to know how to live. I thought that's nice, that's pithy. Um, someone must have said it before. <laughs> so I looked up and actually not many people have said it before. Uh, Auguste Escoffier, the great French chef, said it. But interestingly, he said it in the context of an introduction to a book which basically taught people how to cook good, tasty, nutritious recipes with very little money. So he was really talking about how, you know, to know how to eat is to know how to survive. And that's not what I meant. I meant something much bigger than that. I meant that really, if you can understand the right attitude to eating, the right place of food in your life. Actually, you do have a way in to understanding the right way to live more generally. Now, what I'm going to do is try and explain a bit why that perhaps surprising thesis might be true. Now, let's start with this idea of how we ought to live. It's the most fundamental question of all. Now, if you're going to ask how we ought to live, you've got to start off with a clear and correct idea about what kinds of things we are. And I think if you look at how that's been understood in history, it tends to fall somewhere between two extremes. So there's one kind of view which always imagines human nature to be kind of angelic. Basically, we're kind of immaterial souls who have this kind of temporary inconvenience of being in physical bodies, but you know, don't worry, it will pass. And even people who don't believe that, uh, a lot of philosophers, for, for instance, we'll still think that essentially it's the intellect which really defines who we are, and all the other stuff to do with the bodies is kind of irrelevant, you can ignore it, right? Now, I don't think that's tenable for obvious reasons. I think we've kind of grown out of that view. We do understand that whatever we are, we are physical creatures of flesh and blood, and it's no point in just pretending that our real essence is something just pure and intellectual or spiritual. But on the other hand, the other view, the other extreme can go too far because people say, hey, it's true. We are just animals, and it's like just animals. So there was a song quite recently, some of you may know it, some of you may even be able to sing it better than me, but I believe the, the words go something along the lines of, you and me, babe, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel, <laughs> right? And this kind of captures like that. And, <laughs> And this kind of captures this idea that if we sort of give up the illusion that we're kind of immaterial souls, the answer is simple, we're just animals, right? Well, actually, what's funny about that song is that in the very act of saying those words, he proves he's wrong. Because if there's one thing you never see mammals doing on the Discovery Channel is trying to seduce people through rhyming lyrics, okay? They, we, animals do not have that degree of sophistication. So what we need to do to understand how to live, we need to understand the correct kind of way in which these animal and intellectual and spiritual elements are all fused together. It's not like a combination of two things. It's like we are the kind of creatures for whom we have all these different aspects. And I think that thinking about food and drink actually is a way into understanding that. Now, let's give a few examples, which, which stick with me this, we see how they go. You will be aware of the fact that a lot of the time, things come up in the media about our tastes and preferences, which appear to show that basically all claims to discernment by foodies are all kind of nonsense. So for example, there's a very famous experiment, it's been replicated, where they take white wine, they add a color, a flavorless dye, and it's red, and they give it to people who know a bit about wine, people who are studying wine in wine universities in France, and these people do not notice it is white wine with a red dye in it. They just think it is red wine. And that seems quite extraordinary. Similarly, you have situations whereby uh, people take bottles of wine, a very simple trick, they switch the labels around so the plonk has got the expensive label and vice versa. And even people who should know better uh, often are fooled by this and they will rate the apparently expensive wine better and the apparently cheaper wine uh, worse when it's no such thing. 
And also with food, I mean, a lot of people believe, for example, that it, you know, if you take an, a, a, an egg which comes from chickens like these, it's obviously going to taste better than an egg which comes from chicken like these. And um, maybe sometimes it does, but certainly there are people who have done experiments where they've made scrambled eggs with one, they made scrambled eggs with another, and they've given them to people, and no, they haven't detected the difference. Now, interestingly enough, there's one uh, food blogger who was very clever about this because he noticed that when he tried this, a few people did notice the difference. Not most, but a few did. But he was aware of the fact that the, um, the ones from the you know, outdoor chickens actually had yellower yolks, so there was a kind of a clue in the eggs that one was yellower than the other. So very cleverly, what he did, he added, a, again, a flavorless green dye to both, and once they looked the same, no one could understand the difference. Now, what's this got to do with anything, you may be asking, other than the fact that it seems to show that this is all nonsense? Well, it doesn't show it's all nonsense. If you, if you are a wine, you may be a wine enthusiast yourself. And if you are, you know that actually you can detect things in the wine. If someone gives you a random glass, you can often detect uh, the great variety. Really good people may even know, you know, not only the, the nation, but even perhaps the exact vineyard. What it shows, actually, is something far more fundamental and, in a sense, quite profound. What it shows is that when we eat, actually every act of eating is not a simple animal act where it's simply the food acting on the taste buds in the nose and the smell receptors and giving us a sensation. Every time we eat, our brain's involved, our thinking is involved, our beliefs and our expectations shape and frame what we experience in front of us, and they alter it. Now, in these experiments you hear about, What's being, you know, the, 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 the conclusion people draw is somehow to sort of debunk discernment, uh, debunk gourmandism or, or wine enthusiasm. But that's the wrong lesson, I think. I think the real lesson is a much, say, broader one, which is that you, we should appreciate the fact that actually, you know, there is nothing merely animal about eating and enjoyment. Every time we eat, all sorts of things to do with our brains are involved. And there are lots of different ones that uh, come in there. So, for example, lost a little bit over fast, isn't it? <laughs> Animal welfare, what you know about the animal welfare of the things you're eating. If your free-range eggs taste better than the caged eggs, only because you know they are free-range, to me, that seems to be not a debunking thought. It's actually an important thought. That's the way it should be. We are not just these just animals. It's quite right that our appreciation of what we're eating should alter depending on what we know about it. Um, Similarly, I can't even read that one, producer rights, for example. You know, knowing that your coffee is produced by someone who has been given a fair wage for what they have produced, rather than, you know, not being able to feed their children. If that makes your coffee taste less bitter, all the better. Creativity. When you go to a real high-end restaurant, something like Heston Blumenthal's or something like that, it's not just about the taste of it. Actually, a lot of the enjoyment is, is sheer wonder at the genius of human creativity, what it can achieve, how it can really sort of like, you know, create combinations and experiences that you couldn't even have imagined in that way. Environmental sustainability, another thing to think about. History, again, I think there's something quite profound. When you go and you eat something knowing it's part of a culture and a tradition and how many years people have been making it, that alters your experience. The list could go on and on. Hospitality is obviously an important thing. Food tastes better when it's been cooked for you, for you, as a gift, with love and with care. And um, also, the other thing you might think about is uh, mindfulness I'm going to come to in a minute, actually. This is, this is a big thing about the, the, the way in which our very attitude towards food, the way in which we eat it, alters it. So there's the first fundamental point about food. What food really reveals to us is that our nature is such that we are not kind of like disembodied spirits who have the misfortune to be in bodies, nor are we mere animals. All our experiences bring, bring things together. And in food, that's very, very, very clear indeed. Now, still, there is a worry or a concern, an ethical concern about food, that it's certainly possible to be too concerned about food and eating. Gluttony is meant to be a huge sin, of course. And because gluttony has been looked down on, I think for that reason, there's often a suspicion of people who 
enjoy food. Anyone who enjoys food a lot is often kind of accused of being a bit of a glutton, being greedy, and so forth. And what I really want to suggest here, again, this is kind of misguided and mistaken as well. Because actually, to take pleasure in something like food is not the same as just being a glutton. But nonetheless, I think we have to think about this quite carefully, because if you look about the mistrust of pleasure that you get in lots of philosophical and religious traditions, there's kind of something in it. Sometimes there's nothing in it. Sometimes it's just this horrible distaste for the fact that we're these mucky animals with bodies and digestive systems and all that goes with it. That's not a good reason to be suspicious of pleasure. But there are some actual good reasons to be suspicious of pleasure. I mean, one is that when people say, well, look, for goodness sake, you know, we have to accept the fact that we are just animals, as people say, uh, we're finite, we're mortal, time is short, seize the day, just enjoy every minute, and don't give any thought to tomorrow. It sounds quite romantic, it sounds like it's potentially positive, and yet, in a certain spirit, it becomes destructive, it's not sustainable. Uh, Dorothy Parker wrote a poem where I never get the words exactly right if I remember it, but it goes roughly like this. She says, you know, let's laugh and dance and talk and play and, and, and enjoy the, the whole night through. For tomorrow we will surely die. But alas, we never do. Now, the alas, you'll recognize this feeling. I think we all have that feeling where we go all out to have a really good time and we kind of succeed, but then we wake up the next morning and it's not just perhaps that there's an awful hangover or indigestion or we've done something we regret. It's also the fact that, well, that was nice, but what's next? You know, because nothing's left from it other than the memory and the memories can fade quite quickly. And so there's this kind of, you know, hedonic treadmill, as it's called, you know, that if you're always chasing pleasure, you're always having to chase the next one. Pleasure doesn't store very well. Okay, we do have our memories. It doesn't count for nothing but it doesn't count for a heck of a lot if they're just pleasures with nothing else um, to accompany them. So that's a kind of a, a real genuine problem. How do you get over that? Well, there's a clue. I got a clue when I spoke to a, a Buddhist monk because this Buddhist monk, the, the monastery where he was at, you know, they have meals, they have a breakfast at seven o'clock, they eat at midday and then they don't eat again for the rest of the day. And that's not, you know, that's every day. So this is a whole lifestyle which is designed to basically not really allow you to think too much about your food, not to put too much importance on it. And I kind of said to him, well, why not? Why shouldn't you? I mean, what's wrong? We just, just go, mm, that's nice, that's really enjoyable, you know. Aren't you being too severe? And he said, the problem is this. The moment you start thinking, mm, that's nice, you start thinking, I want more, I want it again, I want it soon. And you get that craving and that grasping and that attachment. And that, he thinks, is problematic. Now, I think there's a truth in that. I think there's something in that. It's possible to get into a situation whereby you relate to your pleasures in such a way that you're never satisfied, you're always looking for the next one, you're always wanting more. But I don't think that's inevitable. I think there is a way of relating to pleasure which doesn't lead to that consequence, which is fully in tune and in harmony with our true human nature, and which allows us to make the most of life without having the illusions that we're greater than we are. And funnily enough, that idea comes from Buddhism itself. It's the mindfulness thing I was talking about before. I think there's a way of relating to pleasure in which you simply appreciate whatever it is that's before you, whatever pleasurable experience you might be having, but you do so in a way in which you are more conscious of how valuable it is because you're not trying to grasp hold of it, because you're aware it will pass, because you're aware it won't last forever. I actually think, if, I think I'm sure that a lot of people agree with this, that sometimes the most intense experiences, the most meaningful experiences, are ones where we are, you know, intensely aware of the fact that they won't pass. That's why they matter so much. That's why they're so wonderful. When you start thinking, when you start assuming that your pleasures, the things that you take joy in every day, are just bound to be here tomorrow, bound to be there the day after, that's when they start to lose their power. That's when you appreciate them less. And so what I'm thinking is that it's not the case that we should shun pleasure in food and drink and other physical 
pleasures. It's just that we need to have the right relationship to them. The right relationship, this is a rather tenuous slide in some ways, but what I wanted to sort of think about here was the fact that we have to relate to our pleasures and enjoyments in a way which does justice to the, to the flow and impermanence of things, that things aren't going to last. Because that is actually doing justice to our full human nature. That's the whole point. We are creatures who don't last, who are always changing, who are always moving forward. And if we try in any way either to escape that by pretending we can grasp on to something eternal and permanent, or by simply trying to cling on too much by what is in front of us, then we can't live a fully a good and satisfying life. And so I think in that respect, thinking about food and the right relationship to food, it is true that if you know how to eat, it gives you an insight into how you should live more generally. And I think that, you know, evidence that this is not an extravagant claim comes from the fact that despite what people may officially say about food and drink being insignificant, you know, human practice speaks otherwise. At monasteries, for example, even though they have quite strict rules about food, it is the meals that they share together, which a lot of them will say, and I've spoken to various monks about this, are the most important things. It's the time for fellowship. It's the time where they are together on an equal footing. The times where they feel most kind of in fellowship with each other and sort of most human. And all the big occasions in life throughout the world a wedding feast, a peasant wedding feast. This isn't about people spending huge amounts of money on the latest gastronomic trend. This is about people celebrating important and meaningful things in life with food, with drink. And I think the reason for that is simple. It's because there's something about eating and drinking which reflects our true nature. And if we can really understand the right way to relate to those experiences, I think we understand the right way to relate to our, our, the rest of our lives and to live in a way which is, as I say, true to the people we really are. Thanks very much.